I was recently encouraged to play one of the most unsettling and horrifying games I've ever seen. It was a complicated experience, and this game is a major trigger point. Without going any further, I do want to encourage you to stop this video and play it. It's free on Steam, and takes about 3 hours in total to finish. It has the potential to trigger you in a number of different ways, as it includes suicide and self-harm. But give it a go, it costs nothing. With that said, what I've done is create a lengthy philosophical reflection on the game, and I've split this up into sections to be consumed in chunks. When I first played through Doki Doki Literature Club, I knew a little about it. Not a ton, but I knew it was a game designed to screw with my mind. I knew things would get dark and that the interface would get messed up. What I wasn't prepared for, for was how completely vapid and frustratingly adolescent the romance is though. The first hour of gameplay is cloyingly sweet and cutesy in its approach. The music is bouncy and warm. The characters are all romantic archetypes from Japanese media. There's the energetic childhood friend, the quiet girl with hidden emotional depths who yearns to share her true self. And then there's the Sundari pixie girl who just wants to be accepted. Oh, and there's the overachiever who is perfect in every single way. As a diversion, it's cute, and the part where you write a poem is kind of interesting. It's an exercise in picking out the first words that come to mind like a linguistic Rorschach test. You never see the completed poem, but the way my thoughts gravitate towards certain words makes me think further on why I chose them. It has gotten me a little bit more interested in writing poetry, truth be told. Day two of In the Game makes me realize the type of words I picked is the way that we choose the girl that we romance. The words about cutesy things go to Natsuki. The words that go with big concepts and darker thoughts are with Yuri. The words about happiness and cheer go with Sayori. I haven't seen any words that make Monica jump here, though that's, that's kind of strange. Maybe she's not romanceable. The game progresses, and there's even more diabetes overload. I picked the right words in the poem to make Yuri interested in me, and now we're reading a book together. It's also... Uh, look, I'm, I'm not into romance in this way. The, the greatest relief in my life was knowing that romance for me and my wife was going to be a matter of finding the biggest wheel of cheese and eating our way through it competitively while there was an episode of Star Trek Voyager on. None of this tenderly touching, tingling tassels as be brief breaths burst, bulging breasts bullshit. I understand that this is teenage romance, and so there's so much more caution and nervousness born out of inexperience. It never really worked that way for me in real life though. When I was a teenager, I was too interested in showing Alf how great I was to actually engage with the person that I was talking to. I did play dating simulators when I was a teenager though. There was a, a beautiful simplicity to them. You said the right things, you behaved in the right way, and the chosen girl, she would like you, and you eventually win. Dating was a game, and you could win it by saying the right thing. This is more or less the red pill belief structure in real life, too, when you think about it. There's no real consciousnesses out there. It's just a zero-sum game where you could win, and others will lose as a result. But you can win. There's a formula. There's a method to talking to women, and you win them as a result. That's why pickup lines exist. Pickup lines are the correct thing to win when first talking to a woman. It's the, the stupidest idea in real life, though. I mean, breaking the ice and making a good impression might be a good idea, but building real relationship takes mutual interest and respect. At the end of this first play session, I did end up thinking about red pills and solipsism. Dating simulators are empty experiences. You're their only consciousness here. None of these are real people. There's no one here but me, and I'm playing with myself. Yuri here gives me the impression of being a person without actually having a consciousness behind it. That idea that I am the only one in the world 
and the only mind that I can truly know, that's solipsism. I am alone. But I can win, and I can amuse myself and divert myself from the crushingly lonely and bleak thought of that. Well, let's see if I can romance Yuri. Yuri's poetry, it's all very carefully considered and evocative. She has taken incredible care in the meter and rhythm of the poetry, even though it's written in blank verse. It's sophisticated. The poems aim to express complex emotions. She's clever. She shows a depth of feeling and identity beneath this shyness and insecurity. Sayuri is an idiot. Natsuki defines herself by opposition. She writes these poems that, in a way, are designed to piss people off and to brook convention. It's actually a pretty natural thing for us to do as teenagers. We are initially defined by our parents and our environments and cultures as children, and then we stop and reject it all. It's not us, after all. We have to stop imitating our parents. We have to reject it all and discover who we really are from a kind of blank slate. Natsuki's poems are just a big f you to the world, and Yuri's literary precision in particular. They really don't get along. Just as an aside, can I just say how much I do not like the Sundari archetype? In Japanese media, Sundari refers to a warm-hearted person with a cold exterior. It takes a while for them to warm up to people and be emotionally vulnerable, also known as the defrosting b That juice is just not worth the squeeze for me. I am looking for a partner, not a project. Sort your shit out, Natsuki, and then we'll talk. Regardless, all of this adds to my growing, my growing discomfort with the dating simulator aspect of this game. I can't lose myself in this fantasy because A, I've already lived through my teenage years and I couldn't get out of that nightmare fast enough, and B, I'm a 34 year old dude and even if I wasn't married, I'm interested in fully developed women, not girls. This is a hazard of getting older I suppose, but this dating sim just isn't doing it for me in that way. The simulation though is engaging when we're talking about poetry. It's cleverly written to make you understand the girls through their own personalities. The poems are an interesting, intimate insight into their intellects. At first, it's just a little bit of disagreement on how they view literature, but there's a growing darkness to it. Monikas are a little bit bland, but I think that they hint towards internal pressures for perfection. An A student is expected to remain that way, and any failure to continue to reach that perfection is a failure of their personhood. I felt that way about myself for about halfway of through high school. At some point, I just realized that I was too unhappy being that way, and I just stopped putting in effort. It became easier to make friends and talk to girls when I wasn't quite so focused on being an A student anymore. I mean, like, it still wasn't successful either way, but hey, you know what? It was still better than before being stressed out of my mind. Maybe I'm projecting a little bit too much onto Monica here, but she does make me think about growth mindsets and the importance of defining ourselves well. Something has gone wrong. The poems are becoming unsettling to read. Yuri's poetry uses violent imagery. Knives are a particular motif. Blood as well. Her stories might be about making friends with a raccoon or lights in the distance or something, but I'm really put off by her imagery. Natsuki's poems point to more than her own assertiveness and rejection of the world. They speak to hatred and prejudice and even in impending violence and confrontation. A cutie Sundari girl doesn't feel those things. Their antagonism is a matter of insecurity and a lack of social skills, not actual hostility and cruelty. <sighs> I 
and Sayori. Oh, oh my god, Sayori. I've watched more than enough anime to know that the childhood friend secretly is secretly in love with me despite not having demonstrated any personality on my part. That's just how the trope works, but her poem is about a voice speaking to her, a deep well of self-hatred that she's worthless and that her friends don't care. She's... She's talking about depression, and not like, oh, I get so sad on rainy days depression. She's... I can't get out of bed depression. The I hate myself and everyone should hate me and the world would be better if I was dead depression. That's not a trope. That depiction of mental illness is just a little too accurate. What's it doing here? I can't concentrate on the romance with Yuri anymore because of how unsettling Sayori's poem was. It doesn't gel with the way that she behaved. Or, or what if... What if I'm unsettled because this is the way that she's always been and I was never paying attention? Sayori says directly that she has depression after a few days and that just hit me like a brick. If you've ever known or loved anyone who's had depression, you might realize that some of those signs were there the whole time. I wasn't paying attention. I found her annoying. I wasn't interested in her as a romantic app match either she was just too happy go lucky and seemingly shallow but then she says that she's had depression for years and never shared it with you she hated herself and found herself too worthless to burden you with this crucial piece of information me i mean my character i'm i'm having real trouble distinguishing between the two now we say all the wrong things it's deterministic everything that has happened in the game has led me along this path there are no meaningful choices here. I can make some choices about the tone I personally want to take through the poetry, but the outcome? Not so much. When someone has depression, real destroy my life and let me die depression, nothing matters. You need protective factors to help you. There's no magic thing that you can say, no one line that'll win the day. The voice in your head will just hate you too much. Depression is unbelievably destructive and it takes many people working together over a long period of time to help with it. Don't say you love me, Sayori. It doesn't matter what I say after this, they'll all be the wrong thing. I could say that I love her and that I'll, or that I'll be her best friend, but it won't matter. Depression needs attention and care, not just words. I say that I'll be her friend. She doesn't take the romantic rejection well. She bursts into tears. No, don't leave. Don't leave. That's the worst. Don't... That's not- she's not okay, don't go! <sighs> she doesn't come to school tomorrow. My character makes some snarky remark about her being lazy. But, but then he remembers that she's got depression and that I crippled her emotionally yesterday when she was vulnerable. <sighs> this poem- this poem is beyond terrifying to read. I, um, I go to check on her. What could, what could you have done differently? What could I have, what did I do wrong? There's, there's no do over here. I don't, there's, there's no way that saying I love you is going to fix this problem. Depression simply doesn't work that way. My choice, <laughs> you can't fix depression with words any more than you could fix a broken neck. Non-standard game over. Try again. This time, maybe not allow your best friend to commit suicide. New game is screwed. The interface is glitching. Sayori has been removed from the game entirely. It's been replaced by this gestalt of other characters. It's really unsettling to look at. The story follows the same structure now, but now it's quicker, shorter, and there are problems. Graphical glitches pop up from time to time, and I am 
completely aware of how artificial this experience is now at all moments. Before I was playing something that was completely cliche, now it's forcing me to stare at this cliche and I'm terrified of what will happen next. It's made worse by this music, it's being played off key at times, wrong notes played, and now the graphical glitches and animations are getting even worse. There are times now where I'm genuinely frightened to play this for fear of what will come next. I feel like I'm prepared, but every time something horrible happens, it seems to just come up from under my guard and shank me right in the vulnerable parts. I'm, I hate this, but I have to see what happens next. It's awful and terrifying and exhilarating and bleak and melancholy, but I'm curious. I really have no idea about where this game is taking me. I'm not thinking about nihilism or self-definition anymore. There's a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche that I think about from time to time, and this is one of those times. Whoever fights monsters should see that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Nietzsche is talking about existential horror here. Humans aren't meant to spend that much of their time overthinking about the shortness and fragility of our experience or the, the nightmare that is our grief, when we over-examine our own fragility, it is overwhelming. It is good to be motivated to seize the day and to have beliefs and live for a purpose knowing that our time is limited. But looking into death too long is devastating to our self-worth and our ability to live. The game is coming apart faster now. The glitches are more unnerving before. Screens are displaying in bright red, there are grainy grayscales, more animations involving blood, the characters are behaving more erratically than ever too. Yuri has become borderline psychotic. Her attention is not that of an adolescent crush or an awakening of desire. It looks like an overwrought sexual appetite with a visceral self-harming component. Natsuki has become jealous in all senses and her behavior is just toxic. Most concerning now is Monica, who has become self-aware. She self-consciously draws attention to the simulation itself. Going into the file directory under the instruction to delete her from Monica's poem, I actually tried to do that. I deleted both Yuri and Natsuki's character files. I can't help but notice that Monica's file is three times as large as the other two, but there's been no indication of why. She's never really expressed that much, and she's never glitched at all. There are additional poems in the file directory, and I'm certain that they're from Monica too. The self-awareness is there, and she's the only one who has demonstrated this quality so far. I was, I was really upset by Sayori's suicide, and the poems in the file directory allude to all of the characters' deaths, past and future. There's a line in there that stuck with me. I don't blame myself for what happened to them. There was no way to prevent Sayori's suicide. I am certain of it now. There would be no point in saves coming to try. She needed pro fact protective factors that were not mine to give. This game has never been about romance. It's this, this moment of self-reflection, asking what am I doing? How am I spending my time and how do I value it? And the further into the game that I go, the more I think that Monica is the actual threat. I think she's rewriting the code and the characters say and do awful things as a result. Those are the glitches. There are no real animations for suicide and for cutting. That's why these images look so awful. They don't belong in the game. It's Monica. Monica's drawing it. She's making it. I don't understand her yet, but I'm a little bit scared of her. I think she'll kill the others. I paused the game on the choice of which girl to spend time with, and it turns out that I was right. No matter what I chose, Monica was the only one that I could pick. When I chose Yuri, which was really difficult to do when the mouse kept moving for me, when I chose Yuri, the girl confessed her love for me. <sighs> and, and then this.
Something odd happened to me emotionally at that moment. The game stopped having inputs. There was nothing for me to do. I couldn't click anywhere. I couldn't change the game. I couldn't leave. Nothing except stare at this lifeless body, powerless to act, to move, to look away. The strange thing is that I wasn't upset in the way that I was when Sari died. That was a genuinely shocking and upsetting, beyond my expectations of something like this. That moment was like watching someone beat a puppy to death. Something pure and innocent has been murdered for someone else's sick amusement. But Yuri, now, at this moment, I was surprised by the stabbing, but I felt nothing for her anymore. I'm watching a puppet show and seeing Monica pull the strings. I was immersed before, but now I'm just waiting to see what she's going to do. I've talked a little bit before about nihilism and ex existential horror. In my video about Far Cry 5, the game was nihilistic because nothing that you could ever do would make a difference in the end. Your choices would mean nothing, like building a sandcastle at the water's edge. When I talked about Soma, a game about existential horror, you're trapped in a situation where your death is certain and the best choice is to act for others. Your acceptance of your fate allows you to act with selfless compassion. But Doki Doki, there's no control here. There's no emotional tone you can set, no outcome you can affect. Just a fatalistic horror unfolding before my eyes. It is inevitable. And I must simply sit and witness the terrors that it wishes to inflict upon me. Monica confessed to doing this to me. She's the puppeteer. I was right. She is self-aware. My solipsism initially was not well-founded because she's here. The other consciousness. The other. Now I'm trapped in this purgatory with her. The whole game, she had been lonely and scared that she would never be happy. That she would be forever in solitude in this digital prison. The only choice that I could personally make was to spend time with Sayori or Natsuki or Yuri. And that was the one choice that Monica could never be a part of. She was locked out of companionship. Her fate was just as determined as mine. I had to be in a romance, sure. But at least I had some semblance of choice within that parameter. For my part, I was always going to choose Yuri over the others. I was just never going to be interested in a hyperactive airhead or fragile asshole like Natsuki. Yuri was the only choice I would ever go for. She's got depth and complexity and is more interesting than the others to me. But even if Monica was an option, I still wouldn't have picked her because she's perfect and I find that dull. Clearly that wasn't the truth about her, but still, my choice was determined from the start. I'm stuck here, staring at this sociopathic smile of hers. I can't leave. Even when I quit the game and started back up, it's still her staring back at me. She's just happy to be freed of her loneliness. I wanted to push at this further though. I wanted to take one final stab at taking control. I went back into the file directory and deleted her character file. But what happens if she's gone? When the game started back up, it broke immediately. She still existed, but was furious. She no longer existed physically. She was beyond mad at me, but after a time, she... reasoned that there was no way for her to be happy here. So, she let me go. She deleted herself. Her sacrifice allowing me to start again, to be happy in the fantasy. A new game, a fresh start. Sayori is alive, Yuri is alive, and Natsuki is getting along with both of them. Everyone's happy now. It didn't last long though. Sayori had gained the same self-awareness that Monica had. And she was now going to trap me in that purgatory as well. No good. But Monica was still there in the background. Quietly watching. There was no way that this was going to work out no matter what happened. And so Monica deletes the whole game. She shuffled us all off this digital coil. The game is now over. This game could only ever end one way. I had very little free will to choose anything here. My path had been determined for me. 
The only thing I truly had any real control over was my perception and my reaction to the experience itself. I'm not a participant in my own play, my own life, not exactly. But how I choose to experience it matters. My attempts to affect the outcome, they mattered too. Not for the outcome itself, but for who I was on the inside. For who I believed I could be. I don't think it matters that all of my attempts were going to fail. I think that what matters is that for me, I tried. And that's an essential component of my experience of life, of my personhood. I'm writing this several days after the last one. The game is still on my mind. The sight of Sayori's lifeless body hanging from the ceiling is fading, but the thought of it still unsettles me somewhat. Monica now feels like a tragic villain to me, sympathetic despite her sociopathy. She was the one trapped in nihilistic fatalism, not me. Could I really blame her for pushing at the game mechanics as far as she did? so that she could be happy? I did the same thing when I deleted her character file. She's not hateful. Loneliness and despair do terrible things to us. It's why we have red pills and incels and terrorists and suicides. Something goes wrong inside of us. We stared too long into the abyss and it causes us to lose the ability to self-regulate, to see the worth in ourselves or in others. I actually went and looked up the game's ending and it seems like I was wrong in saying that the game only had one ending. There was another option. There's a second one. If you take the time to write poems every day for every single girl to spend time with them individually and then you save it and then load it up again and repeat the process for another girl and you do that every single day, the entire outcome comes out exactly the same but Monica doesn't delete the whole game in the end. Sayori still gains self-awareness, but she is contented, knowing that you care for all of them. You spend many hours with them. You, you extend the playtime out from three hours to like nine or ten hours in doing all this, but she sees it all in the game's metadata. She knows what you did in order to engage with all of them, and she doesn't become psychotic. The game ends on a, on a bittersweet note now. You and the remaining girls are happy, even if Monica can't be. Doki Doki Literature Club is a complex, metatextual experience. I can't say that I enjoyed it. The first third of it had me bored. The second part of it had me horrified and I felt really defeated in the third component. I was in a state of frustration and anxiety for hours. It gave me nightmares because I spread my play sessions over several days and the imagery just stuck in my brain. But there's something really powerful to this experience. There's a few things that you could take away from it. I ended up thinking about cherishing the time we have with people because life is far more fragile than we like to imagine it is. I think about struggling against the choices that are apparently made for us even before we start. I think about the person that I want to be and the way I want to experience life even if I can't control any meaningful part of it. Maybe it's still the attempt, the personhood that I want to develop that I really take away from this. Or maybe it's just about not choosing the high maintenance girl because she can seriously sit and take a chill pill. This was actually a very challenging video for me to write. I ended up going through uh, a number of drafts here and my script in the end was eight pages long. If you made it this far, thank you for going along on this experience with me. It's probably spoiled it for you if you haven't played the game, but all the same, there are games that genuinely challenging uh, challenge us and our perceptions. And even though it hurt, and even though this game was unpleasant to do, I am changed for it. And that's something that's worthwhile to do. Thanks for listening, everyone. of me and you.